No, we were slightly interrupted um, just then in midway in defining what SEAL is. And this is the next part. This is called the second part of our lecture on the book of the seven seals. And once again, remind ones and ones that um, this is our first uh, volume, preliminary notes, Rastafari preliminary notes on the H.I.M. Hada Selassie, the first Bible, the book of the seven seals. And this here is a copy of His Majesty's Bible. And once again, we say that the seven seals are this right here. These are the seven seals which say Met Hafik Kedusit. First line Met Haf, last line Kedus. So what we're going to do is we're going to put up on the, the board right here. Let's put up on the board right here. We have room to put meh, se, ha, se, the dots are the word divider, and ke, do, se. Now let's do a, a trans, um, a trans alliteration. Mm -hmm. This will be meh, this would be often se apostrophe there. Some might write it just as a S or in the Sira code in our modified use, we might have it as a capital S, but we have not we have not gone in and lectured that and really taught on that as of yet. So we'll just keep the old form of T S or the T S met met me se. This right here is is the haut ha. It has a sound of not just a regular ha, but more of a ha 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 ha, like met met haf met haf, like when you hear um, Arabic speakers say um, Muhammad 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 ah Ahmed Ahmed. Sometimes even my, ones might put a k h there, but it's, it's an emphatic and it's proper pronunciation. It's an emphatic. In the, in the usual Amharic, it has been somewhat, as we would say linguistically, it has been feminized. When we speak linguistically, some letters, that's what people ask, why in the Amharic there are two or three H's, or there are, there are like two A's, there are multiple of S type of sounds, and two T's. People say, well, why is there this redundancy? It's because in the origination, each particular sound had, just like a musical note, a particular enunciation, pronunciation, a tonal frequency. And we'll touch on some of the frequency as we get more into some of the Ethiopic Kabbalistic level of it. But now this is ha, so met ha. So what we'll do is put a large H here, and for the use right now, we'll put a little dot under it, just to signify this is special and emphatic, not as a regular H. Now the now the vowel would be a A, and then the last is F F met half. So we have the F right there. Then we have over here we have caduce, right? Caduce. So this would be a Q. Often in in certain older Eurocentric Anglo American Anglo European translators and linguists. They often have a, a K, sometimes a large K, and then they have a K with a dot under it. But we're going to go to to the root, and we're going to have a Q sound. It's a Q. Now this is K, K, uh, K, uh, uh. The K uh is the is the sixth order of the or the um the uh, uh sid sidist or the the the, the sidist. You understand? It's the sixth order, and now the sixth order. Is is the e uh sound? So the e eh, u e a uh, a e eh, o. Oh. These are the pure vowels or the pure tonal sounds. E eh, u e a uh, a e eh, o. Oh. So the one it is is it, eh, similar to the s here. So we'll do an apostrophe right there. Now this is the do, right? This is do. So we'll put a d. And a U sound because de do, de do d. So it's the second one, de do. Then this is si, 
This is say this is what they call a schwa. These would be called schwa sounds. This one is a schwa sound. This one is a schwa sound. The f. So the s, the f, the k, and then the last s. And we'll put a lowercase s. A lowercase s. It's a regular s. Or the vowel is actually a sat. Sat s and not uh, shout sh. Not a shout sh, but it's a se. Se, not a sh, sh, sh. Not that one, but the se. Soft, as you'll say it. So we have this, the seven seals are right here. These are the seven seals, but we still must define, we still must define for this lecture, we must define, well, what is, what is a seal? What is a seal? So we can answer whether these are the seven seals. Because people say, well, what do you mean by that? But let's put this into context and let us go to the scripture. Let us go to, um, uh, well, we could go from the beginning, but let's go to Revelation where it's, where, where it's found. Revelation 5.5. 5. So let's turn our Bibles to Revelation 5.5. 5. All right. Let us grab our scripture and bring forth a willing and a repentant um, mind, attentive and repentant mind, so we can receive the half of the story that hasn't been told until now. So we have the Metaf Kedus with the Book of the Seven Seals, and now we're at Revelation 5.5. 5. Are you there with us? All right. So I and I is on the same page. Hopefully we are. If you need a Schofield for your mobile device to, to, to read, to print, to share, go to our website, www.lojsociety.org. You can download it for free. All right? So Revelation 5 and 5, it says, this is the section that is subscribed in the Schofield Study Bible as Christ in his kingly character, as Christ in his kingly character. Then they have a reference to Isaiah 11 and 1, Jeremiah 23 and 5, Luke 1 and 32, and verse 33. It says, Christ in his kingly character opens the book. It is Christos, Christ, the Moshiach, the Messiah, the Messiah which is interpreted Christ or Christos. Christos from the Greek, but you also have Christos as well, which means the kind one, and Christos in the Greek, which means the anointed one. But it's an interpretation from the Hebrew, and the Hebrew is Mashiach. Mashiach. Mashiach means the anointed one. This, the ones who are um, anointed or messiahs in the Hebraic community and in our black Hebrew or black Jewish or the true Judaism, this is the lion of Judaism, you know, we're saying Judah, the true root of Judah, the ones who are messiahs, are priests, prophets, and kings. All three are anointed. They are anointed. So, therefore, they are within the Hebrew context. You know, saying in the context of the scripture, they are messiahs. They are messiahs. And we'll show you in the scripture where it says that Mount Zion, how it waits for its saviors and its messiahs. You know what I'm saying? To be a true Christian, a Christian, one is anointed in the spiritual context from the New Testament, not just the physical sense of being a messiah. That means the literal sense of having oil poured on you, but in the spiritual sense of being anointed by the Holy Spirit because the Spirit um, symbolically or spiritually as a, as, as a type or in the physical um, representative is oil. So oil would equal spirit. Old Testament literal idea of oil would equal New Testament idea of spirit. Or the physical oil of the Old Testament is symbolically now presented as the spirit. That's why Christ said, if I speak earthly things, if you don't understand the earthly examples, like the, what we call in the Hebrew, the Peshat, if you don't understand the Peshat, the plain example, 
how are you going to understand or comprehend the spiritual or the metaphysical or from a Judaic perspective, the Kabbalistic? So, see, it's like the hieroglyphs in a sense. That's what we call it sometimes, verbal hieroglyphs. This is why we use that um, that description or that descriptor. So, Christos or Christ in his kingly character, he opens he opens the book. He opens the book. This is one reason why on the cover of our preliminary notes, and we'll show this to you for a moment. If you look at this cover, you will see you will see you will see that it is uh, it is God the Father holding the book for the lamb, and the lamb would be the, the son. These, this is Christian, Ethiopic, Christian symbolism. And you see there's a book. You see the book right there. You understand? You see the book right there. He's holding the book. And it's interesting that the character of the father is in the character of the Abba Kedus. We have the father in the character of the Abba Kedus, and here is Abba Kedus. You understand? In the character of Abba Kedus. So that, that, that white haired or gray haired man, you understand? Abba Kedus, the father, holding the book, you understand? Holding the book for the son. You understand? Holding the book for the son who is figured as a lamb as it were slain, a lamb as it were slain. Now, this is taken from Ethiopic illuminated manuscripts, this, this particular art right here, this particular painting is from Ethiopic illuminated manuscripts. And so now the illumination, this would be considered the illumination, it shows, it shows God the Father holding the book for the Son, right, who is pictured here as a lamb, as though it had been slain, as a lamb, or as though it had been slain, just like Revelation 5.5. 5. Now here's the revelation. Abba Kedus, he is the revelation. You understand? The revelation. Now we'll get into much more, y'all willing, of that. So let's return to the scriptures now. So when Revelation 5.5. 5. Now, Revelation 5.5 5 says, And one of the elders, one of the Shema Gliwoch, one of the white-haired or gray-haired men, you understand, but one of the elders, they wasn't just elders because they were gray-haired, but they were gray-haired, and they were elders. You understand? So the description of the elders, you understand, from the root of the word is one who is gray-haired, but moreover, see, that's the literal side of it. But the spiritual or the real app or the applicative is one who has that wisdom, is one who is, is mature, is one who understands or who comprehends. They don't just have knowledge, and they don't, don't just have wisdom, but they have knowledge, wisdom, and overstanding. They've come to that triune level of maturity. That's what an elder, when we speak about an elder. So this is important when we seek to now understand and comprehend what it's saying here. Now, an interesting side note, but it's, it's, it's very relevant in this sense, is that in some translations by certain Europeans of some of the Ethiopic uh, manuscripts, such as the book of Hainok or the Ethiopic Hainok, the Metzhafe Hainok, as well as the Metzhafe Kufale, which is the book of Jubilees, also called Little Genesis. The book of Jubilees also has a secondary name in the Western context of Little Genesis. But Bamarin, uh, in the Gutters from the Ethiopic, it is called the Metzhafe Kufale or the Book of Divisions, the Book of Divisions, the Book of Portions or Division. But in these works, it speaks of spiritual, eschatological, and even, in a sense, historical things, you understand, in a symbolic or a verbal hieroglyphic language. And many of the Europeans and, and, the, and the linguists and, and scholars and ones who have translated uh, have translated one portion of, I think, the book of Hainok as well as the book of um, Jubilees. It mentions white-haired or gray-haired men. And the, some of the translators have actually mistranslated that as white men, 
as white men. We refer to this elsewhere, but we'll go into it in some further detail, hopefully in its own lecture, its own context. So we put that there for a note as a footnote. We footnote what we're saying here with that right there, that they've translated where it says actually in the goodness. And when we saw this in the English translation, we say, what? White men? That these angels were white men? We said, so let me go look it up. So we looked up in the Ethiopic and, and then compared it with uh, His Majesty's translation of those other 15 apocryphal books that are elsewhere. We found that it, it had nothing to do with their racial, you know, some racial European, Indo-European types, but that they were gray-haired men. Men. So when it says the white men in the, in, in the mistranslations of the book of uh, Enoch and the book of Jubilees, more correctly, if you go to the Ethiopic and if you go to the Royal Amharic, you will find it correctly as gray-haired men, or in the context of Revelation 5.5, 5, they were elders. So these, quote, angels, these messengers were elders. So it says here, and one of the elders saith to me, weep not, don't cry, don't weep, Atalkis, Atalkis. Don't cry. Behold, look and see. Sight, look and see. The lion of the tribe of Judah or Yehuda, you understand, the lion of the tribe of Yehuda hath prevailed. But that context of hath prevailed, if you look in the Gutters, and, and we're about to publish um, the Gutters New Testament as well for the students and Dekamiz Amorit and Talmudin and, 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 and disciples and ones who want to study and read it for themselves, that it says in Revelation 5 and 5, it says, Moa andesa ze ima negeda Yehuda. Moa andesa ze ima negeda Yehuda is literally what the good is says in Revelation 5, 5, that the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. So that's this whole context. It says, behold, look and see, sight. This is going to be a manifested thing. When it says, behold, it's often saying this is going to be a manifestable reality, although it may be um, prophesied in a verbal hieroglyphic symbolic language, this is something that's going to happen. It's going to have its real world application. You understand? So what we're reading here in its symbolism in Revelation 5.5 5 will have its real world app, its real world manifestation. This is why it says, behold, and that, oh, look in sight, not who, not who in the good is. Look in sight, behold, here it is, or literally, look, here he is. See, here he is, sight, sight him right here. Behold, witness this, bear witness to this. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root, it says the root of David, the root of David hath prevailed, hath prevailed, more, he has overcome. To do what? To open the book, to open the metahaf, and to loose, to loose the seven seals thereof. Now, there are some other works out there by some other Rastafari, and this is not to, you know, um, uh, negatively crit criticize their work, but we must be critical. We even want ones to critique. You understand, not just from, uh, you know, just a hate or some disgusting spirit, but from a true brotherly love critique. If, if, if we are doing something that is incorrect against the way, the truth, and the life, then to point that out in context and let us reason on it. So this is why we're touching on this from some other um, Rastafari brothers and sisters out there. There's a web page if you look up Hala Selassie and Seven Seals and go to your Google or Bing or whatever your particular choice of search engine might be and go put in Hala Selassie and uh, Book of the Seven Seals or Seven Seals, Hala Selassie and Seven Seals in the search engine. And you'll find there's a page out there that says Hala Selassie breaks. It says he breaks the seven seals. And we was commenting just the other day, we said that that is, that's wrong. I mean, we shouldn't, we shouldn't do that, you know, like adding in things, adding on things like that, or putting it in different language that at its root means something different. It's not using a different expression that essentially means one and the same thing, like tomato or tomato, but it's putting in a different context or a different idea. 
because Hala Selassie is, is the imperial majesty, does not break the seven seals. It, see, the, the word break is totally different word. You know what I'm saying? It said the line of the tribe of Judah shall break every chain. Well, that's, that's a whole different thing. The seals, in that sense, are not chains in, 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 in that way of, 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 of thinking or that way of representation. Now, here's a book. Me and a brother in um, Ras John, this is the heel of Ras Johannes, or Brother Johannes, or may I say Lidge uh, Johannes, because the eye is still growing, but the eye will grow into the eyes of Ras ship. Now, um, to heal up the brother, because we was reasoning, and uh, this is, this, is uh, this book, this is not his book, but this is a book um, that has been produced by um, writings of the scribe uh, Colin Ray Selassie, edited by Shango Baku. Shango Baku here says, How the Selassie and the Opening of the Seven Seals. Now, years ago when I had uh, purchased and got a copy of this particular um, book, I was very happy, but I was also a little bit, you know, like excited. I was like, wow, another brother recognizes the Majesty's Bible. I'm like, that's good, because I felt my job or my, my work would be a little more difficult because it's like ones and ones had no knowledge of this. So when I heard about this book, I was happy to read it, read it and, but going through it, I was a little bit disappointed. And for some years, I was like, this also inspired me more and more to gather my data, gather the facts, and really put it out there. I'm like, that's not it. Or that's, you know, I was, because I didn't find any word of His Majesty's Bible or the Amharic and that real root, our real divine heritage from its core. You understand? But then the Holy Spirit tempered me, you know, the Spirit of His Majesty tempered I. You know, because sometimes I and I as brethren, we can, we can get like that. And if you, if you don't know that or you don't recognize that, you're not being honest and, and, and you need to, to, to recognize that, that, that sometimes we're like that. And, and be, being a true follower of his majesty and his Christ, we, we go through a refining process, you know what I'm saying, to become a new man, you know what I'm saying, a new man in spirit and in truth. So our old nature, a lot of the negative characters of our old nature, by and by, we mortify them or we put them to death. You know, we dead those old things in order to make room for the newness of the King of Kings and his Christ. You understand, walking in the way of his Christ. So that tempered me somewhat because then, then I went over the book again. And I said, you know what, it's really not a bad book. It's really a pretty, a pretty good book for the fact that he was able to at least see a prophetical and a historical relationship to the manifestation, the beholding of Moa and Bessas and Emma Negeti Yehuda, or the conquering line of the tribe of Judah, Yovas, and that each of us have our particular role to play, have an inspiration to put out there, um, have a word to say. And I say to a lot of brothers and sisters, if you didn't get a copy of this, please do get a copy of this book too. You understand, to recommend, you know, the works of, you know, the works of others. And my brother's um, book, or who I just healed up, let me give him a, a, a heal up in this particular video, if we can, for his particular book, a book of poems by Ross John Farai, which is called uh, Israel, you understand, Israel Unite, Israel Unite, this is his book right here. Oh, this is his book, uh, Israel Unite, Ross John Farai. And this is our brother right there. You understand? With the uh, Sendek Alama, with our flag. You understand? And um, this book right here, since we mentioned him, first said just, you know, um, heal up the brother's work right here. Because we want to heal up and encourage the works of our brothers and sisters. It's very, it's very important to our. Um, to our way of life as well as 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 Jai Rastafari's economy, the economy of Jai Rastafari of I and I. So now, with that being said, we just want to mention this book right here, um, which we were like we said we was a little bit disappointed with it because I didn't touch on it. But there's a brother that we do want to heal up, and this brother because these are ones we feel that you should know of, you should support, you should pray for, and support them in their efforts. This particular brother is um, Ross Seymour McLean. Ross Seymour McLean out of UK. 
He has done some very patriotic works on behalf of Rastafari and his Imperial Majesty. And we hope that, um, you know, we, we pray and hope all is well with him. We've seen some pages up there about the Jubilee, that this is a Jubilee year with, with him um, echoing that same message that the Holy Spirit sent into our heart and we spoke of a little bit earlier um, concerning his Majesty's Bible. This is the 50th year, and he's the only other brother that I know of, Ross Seymour McLean, who has touched on the issue or the subject matter of His Majesty's Bible, even with actual um, demonstration, you know, saying, of this particular Bible, this Bible here, you know, saying, and, you know, we love that brother. In fact, he's one who had, had put this out, too. This was His Imperial Majesty's uh, preface, the preface which was removed from the 1962 publications of the book because it went through the, um, what they call that again, the United Bible Society, which say that they are non-denominational. So even with the King James Bibles that they put out, they take out King James um, forward. You know, so that's nothing to really, yes, we would prefer it there, but it's, it's understandable. And His Majesty, understanding that and overstanding that, put that forward so that it can get dissemination throughout the world or throughout the entire world. You understand? And this book or Bible used to be offered, you understand, at the, the, the Bible societies elsewhere, but many of them seem to have um, apostatized themselves. And they instead are offering this new Amharic Bible, quote unquote, which is basically the Good News Bible published out of out of Rome. And in fact, this we call it the Jesuit, the Amharic Jesuit Bible, uh, another Bible, which is Amharic Bible, which is out there. And um, we've touched on that before, but hopefully we'll get into some of that, so one can distinguish between this and that. Yovas. So this particular is the Mets of Caduce. I know a lot of folks have been asking I and I about this particular book, when we're going to get more copies, and we're trying to work our way up to being able to publish this, you know, and to publish our own book so that at least everyone can have their hands and their hearts on a copy of this until such a time as we can, you know, get the presses, the more official presses up and running again concerning the Mets of Caduce in the Amharic. You understand? This is this is Amharic Bermulu. Now, the next item that we want to touch on. Now, when we talk about the 81 books, now yes, His Majesty translated the 81 books. There were 81 books in the entire volume, but putting it across through the United Bible Society, it was put forth as the 66 books alongside so that, and this is the wisdom, this is the, the supreme wisdom of our Godfather of the King of Kings, in and through the name of Getachini Jesus Christos, the Moshiach, is that he, in his wisdom he put forward those 66 books so that we can look at King James Version and look at Hala Selassie's Version, what we have been firstly foremostly familiar with, those basic books of the Old and the New Testament side by side. That's the real foundation. I know a lot of folks, they talk about the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jubilees and some of the other apoc apoc apocryphal, apocryphal books. They speak about these other books, and these books are important, the Book of Maccabees, so forth and so on. But the basic foundation, you don't, if you're building a, a sky rise, you don't build the penthouse on the ground floor. It's something that I've said before. You don't, you don't start with the penthouse on the ground floor. There's no penthouse really that's on the ground floor unless it's a penthouse magazine, and that's a whole different matter there. But if you're building a penthouse, you put the penthouse where it belongs in its proper position is what, what we're saying. The cornerstone, the cornerstone of biblical studies and, and true Christian and true Christianity and the root of even Judaism is based on the Torah, you understand? Know it's based on, on, on the Torah. It's based on the prophets. It's based on the writings. It's based on the, 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 the songs or the poetical books. You understand? Know that sometimes are called the, the, uh, the megalot. The megalot as well. It's based on that basic foundation. Even Christ, Christos himself, the Moshiach, our Lord and Savior, Adonai, Yehoshua, even he himself said, and he said it best. He said, you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Now, it's interesting that he said to ones that should have known the scriptures, 
You understand that were religious authorities, and people saw them as being knowledgeable in the word of God and authorized, like almost anointed by the community to serve that function, did not know the scriptures. It's like today. A lot of the pastors and preachers, they got those soundbite verses down pat, but they don't know the Bible, not in its real context. You understand? Therefore, what you get over time is immature people, people who have not really grown up and who really don't, do not reflect the master. You understand? Christ said that it's enough that the, that the servant is as, or the slave is as his master. You understand? In, that, in, in, in his context. Unfortunately, the slave, the so-called lost sheep, the Beit Israel, the black sheep of the family, the, the black people don't know that they're Jews and Hebrews and how and why we got into this. They have taken that, that word of Christ and had become like Masa, you understand, not like the Moshiach, not like Christ in his kingly character. So let us continue right here with this verse, because this verse is important. This verse is, is what sets up the real context of what we're about to touch on, but let's not do like those that we also reprove in the name of Yehoshua HaMoshiach, in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's not do like them. Let us go to the beginning of the book, and let's put it into a better context, what we have here in Revelation 5 and 5, so we can understand the book of the seven seals, you know what I'm saying? And these seven seals, one, meh, two, si, three, ha, four, fi, five, ke, six, du, seven, si, the metahafik dus. The Metaf Kedus. But that's not all. People say, well, this is called seven letters. That's No, this goes deeper than that. It goes much deeper than that. Check out I and I preliminary notes, and it will give you a little more insight. It give you a preliminary, we call this a groundation. This right here is just a groundation to the book of the seven seals. You understand? Because the book is all in the heart, uh, in heart fully. People have been asking about translation. You need to translate. You need to go from lower English Anglo degrees to higher Ethio and Ethiopic degrees. You need to go to higher degrees in the teaching of his imperial majesty. And we say that mainly and mostly to our fellow Rastafari brethren and sisterin and, and the mothers in our community. We need to go to those higher heights so we can build until a, a, a generation, as he says, next time send the right people, that when we come forward, we will be those right people, that the angels, you know what I'm saying, the higher and righteous extraterrestrials will say, who are these people? You know what I'm saying, who are these people who are dressed in, in white robes? And the answer will be they have washed their garments in the blood of the Lamb. Now, remember the Lamb symbol from right here on the cover of the book. You understand? This illuminated um, um, art right here. So you see... Uh, the Abba Kedus, Kedus Abba and the Lamb. You understand? And you see the book, where the book is open, and the Lamb as though it had been slain. Now, putting it into context, beginning with verse 1, this is the seventh sealed book. We're speaking of the seventh sealed book. You understand? The seventh sealed book. Now, what does it say here in Revelation 5 and 5 concerning the seventh sealed book? And then we'll, we'll continue with what is a seal. What is a seal? We'll, we'll pick up where we left off. This is actually the book that we were looking for, this particular book. It was a, a freebie some years ago, um, National Sunday Law, by, um, by A. Jan uh, Markison, um, Forces Unite Amid Stupendous Crisis. And we're going through stupendous crisis now. I mean, so stupendous. People are just dumbfounded. That's why they call it stupendous, like stupid. You know what I'm saying? Such stupid crisis in this present time. But Revelation 5 and 1 says, And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side. Now, it says the book is written within. That means it has, it's, it's in a language. It's written within. And on the back side, on the jerba or the back of the book, you see right there, it's written with those seven seals. You see those seven seals right there. All right? Sealed with seven seals. It's sealed with seven seals. Verse 2. 
and I saw a strong angel, a strong melaak. You understand? A strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Question. He asked the question, who is what? The key word is worthy. That's the key word. Who is worthy? Ones could try to, but are they worthy? You understand? Are they worthy? That's a note right there. Put worthy down. What does worthy mean? You see, when we study this, we ask ourselves, what does worthy mean? That's the key word that the whole overstanding lynches on. What does worthy mean in that context? What does worthy mean in that context? To do what? To open the book, one, right? So there's an opening of the book. What does that mean in the context of the revelation of his imperial majesty and the Metzhaf Kedus? What does it mean? Does it, does it interpret? Are we interpreting this fully? Because some say, oh, that, 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 that sounds a little bit true here, but, but it, I, don't think it, I don't think that's what it means, they say. So what we're going to do is demonstrate some of the facts and then please show us where we're wrong. You understand? Or acknowledge and admit that we are correct in this. And then the implication of that, not us being correct, but he being who he is and this being what it is. And to loose the seals thereof. Now, to loose, it doesn't say to loose how many seals, according to translation here, and we'll compare that with the Amharic, but it says then to loose the seals thereof. And it says then no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth. Now, notice the places where it says that there was no man, right, no man in heaven. Now, this, this, this points out an interesting question because um, what does it mean that there was no man in heaven? I mean, can a man see people's ideas is that, well, people are still trying to get into space, but according to this, people were already in, in space. On, on some level, one might say it's just symbolic, but we say it's symbolic, yes. There's, there's an eschatological interpretation, but there's also an actual application to this as well. Otherwise, so said, as, a, as a so-called Christian, then what does it mean where Christ, where he ascended? Are you saying this is just symbolism? Because people don't want to admit or my men, or what they misinterpret as so-called believe, it means that they accept, they don't have trust and confidence that the scriptures in truth is saying exactly what it is saying, even though it may seem to some of us, oh, well, man in heaven, no, that's just symbolic right there. It can be really a man in heaven. Are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian. You believe that? Yes, I do. But I don't think that's, into, well, so Christ raised up into heaven. That's just symbolism there. You understand? When, when Estefanos, Caduceus Estefanos was looking up, staring straightwayly straight, straight into heaven, that was just a symbolism there too as well. You know what I'm saying? And, and when, the, when the book of Ezekiel talked about flying ships, that was just symbolism there. All of this is just symbolism, so they say. But now when they tell you, oh, they're seeing stuff up in space, so, so people are now more, or you see a movie, you believe the movie that people say, I think that could really happen, even though it was a movie, and here is the word of God and Christ, and ones would deny it. But that is still their, their, their choice and their pleasure, if it is pleasure. And no man in heaven, nor in the earth. Now, to, to say no man in earth, is that just symbolism too? Or is that real? It's not real here, but it's real there. See, that's where you could tell that those ways of, of, of interpretation are false, are wrong ways of interpretation. You understand? But the key thing, it, it then connects is neither under the earth. Now, some say, well, this means the people who are dead. You understand, the people who are dead are the people under the earth. But then, along with those in heaven, it is known that there are people who do live under the earth. There are rock-hewn churches in Ethiopia. There are tunnels and underground passageways in Ethiopia and many parts of the world. You understand where people are and where there are beings who are human and human-like. Now, people say, oh, that's, that's fantastic, but notice, they'll watch a movie and spend all that time with a movie, and if you ask them, they think that there's a possibility that it might be true, depends on how good they make the movie. You understand? So that means they are able to accept men and people, you understand, but not accept the truth of God's word in the same context. But the key thing is that there was no man in heaven, 
nor in earth, neither under the earth, that was able, that did not, they did not have the ability to what? To open the book, neither, and here's the key thing, neither to look thereon. Notice this, if you will, that many of the ancient Ethiopic scrolls and texts, um, such as the book of uh, Enoch, and such as the book of Jubilees, that all of these works were virtually unknown to Western Christianity, to the, to the Catholics and to the Protestants. They had versions of it, but it was when, when, they, when they saw the right thing, they recognized the counterfeit that they had. You know, they said you can only tell a, a counterfeit if you can look at the, the, the right thing or the, or the correct, the genuine, authentic bill. So when they discovered, so-called discovered, um, the book of Enoch and the book of Jubilees and other scrolls, you know, and the other writings which are in their full um, preservation in Ethiopic, in Gutters, ancient Ethiopia. We here have to acknowledge the, the, the faithful, let's call it the faithful genius, you understand, of our people. You know, understand to preserve, you know, understand, in a, a clear, a concise, a pure, and Afro Shemitic language those roots and truths so that we can look at all that we have received elsewhere and really compare it side by side. And now speaking on side by side, we want to say one other word. One other word we want to say on that. Um, this is also another one that we have our own uh, version of the New Testament. This is another document and book as well called the Adis, you understand, called the Hadis, the Adis, you can see it right there, the Adis Kidan, you understand, the Adis Kidan right here, this is, this is um, our printing and publishing of this particular volume, and you can find this along with some of the other volumes that we have been speaking on at www. LOJSociety.org forward slash books or click on the books tab at the LOJ Society, the Line of Juice Society um, main website in the U.S. Um, now, the Addis Kidan, the New Covenant, the New Testament, we have this side by side as well. You know what I'm saying? This is a, is a side by side where we actually compare, and this, all this was published this year. So, all these publications that we are that we are showing, demonstrating, and asking those who are able, you know, we're saying to patronize and to obtain a copy of, as well as there's other free downloadable information at our website. Um, all this has been published in this, this uh, uh, jubilee, this special, a special jubilee year. And this jubilee year is since the first publication of the Book of the Seven Seals, the Metaf Kedus, of his imperial majesty. This is what is noteworthy about these publications that we say let him be praised for, for, for giving I and I the well wherewithal and all of those who have assisted I and I, like the first lady of the society, I and I sister wife and other brothers and sisters through their prayers, through their donations, their, their free will offerings towards the ministry of his imperial majesty and we encourage those who are seeking to establish a study group, a line of Jesus study group, uh, a Bible society, or perhaps a more churchical operations, a branch in their area to, to continue with us, to keep walking in the way, the truth, and the life of Gitachina, Mehanatachin, Jesus Christos, and hopefully in, in, in due time we'll be able to manifest, you understand, know manifest that which is according to the will of our Godfather and King of Kings. But first things first, we need that basic cornerstone um, knowledge and building. We need to build on the, the sure foundation of the teachings of His Imperial Majesty. And that's what the line of Judah ministry is all about. You know what I'm saying? It's about the teaching. Education is the key. Because there's just so much that we do not even know you know what I'm saying, about ourselves, and therefore when we get to learn this, we get to see that we have other options other than the options that, that, that Babylon, you know what I'm saying, and, and the confused world system and system have presented 
to us, has presented to us um, thus far, has presented to us thus far. So now let's get to, into the next um, into the next part of this right here, where where after Johannes recognized, or after he saw in his Rai, this book is called Ye Johannes Rai in the Royal Amharic, the pure language of Negus and Negus, and that means the vision of Yah's grace. If we would translate it and interpret it, it means the vision, the Rai of Johannes, Ye Johannes, and Johannes means the Eo of Hana, the Eo of Hana, or the grace, the Hana of Yah, of Jah, of Yahweh, Lotu Sibhat. Now, here, after seeing there was no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, that had the ability, that, 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 that had the capacity or the ability to do what? Two things. To open the book, neither to look thereon. Didn't even have the capacity to even look at it. So we see that there is an interesting historical manifestation of God and history right there that there were many who could not, you understand, they didn't even know of these other, they knew of these scriptures by name. You understand, they knew of these books uh, by name, the book of Enoch. In fact, they discovered in the Ethiopic book of Enoch and through the Ethiopic book of Enoch that much of what we have in the New Testament, the scriptures that those of the New Testament knew, even in Christ and the disciples' mouth, there are many, 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 many. There, I mean, there's, there's a lot of quotes from the book of Enoch as well as the book of Jubilees. This is what's very, very interesting. That means that in their time when Christ says, says you do err, you're in error, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, that the scriptures that Christ was referring to as well and the disciples that which they even knew, because he didn't say to his disciples, he said to the Pharisees, scribes, and the religious authorities, it's interesting now that we have the Ethiopic um, scrolls, and, and, and this is more known within the world, and you can look it up, and there's a lot of research that has been done on these documents. Some, some naysayers, we call them racist, racist, ignorant, so-called intellectuals, you understand, who have a racial problem in spite of the proof. So in spite of the proof that we prove of the Ethiopic and of the Ethiopian claims and our claims, they still are deniers. They are kahadiwoch. You understand? They have a monophic. You understand? They have a monophic in their hearts and in their minds against the truth. So there's not much we can do for them. You understand? For them at the present time. Yovas. So what we do is we, like I say, travel wide. You understand when dealing with these and those, but we recognize that they are deniers. You understand? But what happens next in, in, in this part of uh, Revelation chapter 5 is after he found there was no man who had the ability to open the book, neither to even look thereon. Because the European only got to look, and the white folks and the, and the Protestants and the Catholics and the European Christians only got to look on many of these ancient documents fairly recently. We could say within the past hundred, and maybe be gefa, be gefa if you push, if you push it. You understand? Let's say maybe last maybe two hundred or so years since they really had an opportunity to even look on these things. So when you look in the age of Christianity, in a sense, and 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 the context of this, some say this was written roughly ninety A.D. by um, Caduce Johannes by the disciple Johannes, the one who Yehoshua loved, about 90 A.D., so the first century, from the first century to roughly maybe the 1800s or so, before they were able to look on many of these books which were preserved where? In Ethiopia. Why? Because as princes shall come out of Egypt, Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands unto God. You understand? And it says, and I will make mention of Babylon and Rahab to them that know me be, with Ethiopia. Behold, this man was born there. This man, who is that man? Many still think it's just incredible to think that this is really fulfilled in Ethiopia or through Ethiopia. And Haile Selassie plays a significant role in Bible prophecy. And I and I, the Rastafari, are spiritually in principle right and exact about our claims concerning the King of Kings and his Christ. 
And some find that hard to believe, hard to accept, but remember the Kahadi principle. They are deniers, you understand, and many are liars, and many are just the children of disobedience, and many have fallen astray and gone astray. And you know what? That's good for them because that's their choice. If, that's, if that is their choice, if that is their free will choice, that's why all must hear the gospel, all must hear the good news, and then the end. So people ask us, well, what should be our mission? Besides building and tilling together, it should be about the proclamation of the good news so that all would have had an opportunity to hear and to decide for or against the good news of the King of Kings and his Christ so that we can bring this shitstem, this system, this Gentile world dominion, the counterfeit church age, we can bring it to its prophesied and written conclusion. And we can go on to, as I say, newer things and, and better things. We can go into a true new world order. You know, not their new world order, but the King of Kings and his Christ's new world order. Because whose new world order is it anyway? You can't tell me that their thing is new world. That's 1776. They, they, already, they already had their, their time. The Gentiles have had their time. You understand, um, and their time is just about done. But remember, what we reason about time in the context of that. It, it, it's a consciousness, it's a certain reality. So we have to declare, you understand, what that reality is and create that environment in our heads and hearts and fellowship and have it spread abroad. And that brings in the atmosphere, you understand, for the Adesiti to Jerusalem, you understand, for the Crystal City, for for the new, the true new world in which dwells righteousness, where righteousness can dwell in the true new world order of the King of Kings and Christ. So John said, because there was no one who could have even opened the book nor looked thereon at this time, nearly from this point, nearly 1900 years ago, roughly. I wept much, and I wept much. Johannes, he wept. He didn't just weep a little bit. He didn't cry, but he wept. You know, when you say, I wept like a baby, you know what I mean? And, and he wept much. So let's just understand the emotion, you understand, when we recognize what was, what was not able to be done. You understand, what was not able to be done. There was, there, there was a suppression of the word, even if you look from the European perspective, you understand it's only fairly recently that most European Christians they've been fighting and dying for the right to even be able to read the Bible. When you look in the European white Western Christian sense, that that kind of shows the prophetic of it as well in the Scripture and shows who's who. So he wept much. He says, "And I wept much because no man was found worthy. There was no one who was worthy." to open and to read the book. So as you go each sentence and study each sentence in context, you understand, in its proper context, now it says that no one was able to open and to read the book. Before, the verse before it said to look on it. So they, they can look on it and therefore they can read it. But, but how it's developing gradually, little by little, the clarity you understand, of that symbolism or so-called eschatological picture, you understand, and we can see the manifestation as well, where, where now God and history is judging these, these events for us because we're seeing it in its proper context. You can deny it all you want, but the facts remain. You cannot present a logical counter-argument. All you're going to deal with is the logics. And we're dealing with the logos. So, therefore, we're dealing with what is logical and seeking to demonstrate and prove what we're saying. You understand? So, we can prove our case because these are judgment days. You understand? So, we are arguing, you understand, in other words, for the King of Kings and his Christ. We're prose prosecuting a case for the King of Kings and his Christ. That's what this is about. So, John wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither neither now to look thereon. So what was inserted now is reading, reading. Notice that. Notice how reading is put right within the midst of verse 4 of Revelation chapter 5, that no one could read the book or found worthy in the whole context to read the book. Isn't this interesting? How read, you remember for us as black folks or our ancestors, let's say it like that, in chattel slavery, 
how they were forbidden to even read the Bible, and then how white folks and white Christians forbade each other to read the Bible, and there were great wars and persecutions. All this is, is real world history. This is real world. You understand? This is real world history. There was a lot of good white, white Christians. When we say good, they were inclining themselves to good because they wanted to understand what's in the Bible for themselves. And they were forbidden by the so-called Roman or mystery Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church, predominantly from even reading the Bible. So in Europe, there was a Protestant movement, and from there we got the Evangelicals and the Pentecostals and the Methodists and the Baptists and all these other different kind of um. Um, denominations all broke, all came from that particular tree. That's the tree they came from. But now we're finding that as we get regrafted into our own root and truth, you understand, as we look to the East and to the King of Kings and his Christ and to his church and the foundation of his church, we have additional scriptures that are not known in the West but are known and been testified in and verified by many of their top scholars over the last couple of um, ages as being authentic and ancient Christian writings and works that I call the Ethiopic Midrash. I call